So, okay, yeah, this is the Metaphoric Foundations of Lawrence's Dark Knowledge by Patricia L. Hagen in Texas Studies in Literature and Language. So there we go. And as always, this is my first time reading it. Um, let me know what the questions are. If you're watching this later, the link will be in the uh, description below. Okay, and thank you, Sin and Semiotics, for uh, recommending this. So, yeah, and as always, ask whatever along the way. I don't know what the fuck's going on. Drop the music. Despite its primacy in critical thought, metaphor is subject is a subject rarely discussed in considerations of D.H. Lawrence. Even, even a cursory examination of his poetry or prose, however, reveals a highly metaphoric style. The following statement of Lawrence's poetics, taken from his preface to Chariot of the Sun, provides an excellent example. Well, I, I know you don't, because you've had one or two stinkers. Most of them are interesting, but I know you've had a stinker in there, and uh, I was pretty sure you... I was like, he didn't read this. <laughs> So, <laughs> no, I understand. <laughs> and what's interesting is, uh, Valpo, you, I know you follow some of the uh, philosophy blogs. There was just a post on uh, Daily News complaining about philosophy writing and it being terrible. And, you know, people were trying to defend philosophy writing in the uh, chat. And, uh,. I was like, no, the person writing is completely right. Philosophy writing is mostly terrible. And I'm very uh, hopeful that this is because this is in a, a language and literature. Uh, what was it called again? This is, uh, yeah, literature, Texas studies in literature and language. I'm hoping this is going to read better than most of the philosophy I read. So, um, yeah, like people were trying to defend philosophy writing. And it's just people who don't know better defending themselves. Uh, defending their writing because they don't know any better. That's the only thing I got out of, like, a lot of the defense. They're like, no, our writing's fine. It's like, no, you, you're an idiot, and that's why you think, well, not you're not an idiot. You haven't put any time into understanding what makes for good writing, and that's why you have no standards. <laughs> like, okay. Okay, so this is from his preface to Chariot of the Sun, provides an excellent example. The essential quality of poetry is that it makes a new effort of attention and discovers a new world within the known world. Man and the animals and the flowers all live within a strange and forever surging chaos. Man fixes some wonderful erection of his own between himself and the wild chaos and gradually goes bleached and stifled under his parasol. Then comes a poet, enemy of convention, and makes a slit in the umbrella and lo, the glimpse of chaos is a vision, a window to the sun. You see, you ain't never getting this shit in a philosophy paper. <laughs> like, that was just so much more fun to read. It flowed well. It sounded interesting. Oh, man. It's, <laughs> it's like, yeah, what are these other philosophers reading that, like, they think their writing is good? Okay. In this statement, Lawrence implicitly acknowledges the metaphoric nature of language, never saying what a thing is, only what it is like. The umbrella metaphor structures his entire discussion of the poet as revolutionary. Indeed, Lawrence's umbrella metaphor points, towards, points toward a view of the poet as a deconstructionist, searching for and creating cracks and fissures in conventional metaphors so that they can be pried apart, creating a window to the sun, creating, that is, another metaphor, but one which emphasizes what conventional metaphors suppress. Yeah. Yeah, it was the uh, writing thing, uh, the Daily News by Rini, exactly. Um, yeah, complaining about signposting, which I complained to no end, I've complained to no end about on uh, Philosophy Roulette. I'm like, why is there so much signposting? I don't care. Like, just get on with your fucking paper. So, yeah, the quoted passages, I mean, well, Lawrence, like, <laughs> knows how to write, <laughs> as opposed to, like, a lot, knows how to write very, very well, so... I, did I, I? I may have even got sick of like reading their complaints. I may have skimmed it. I don't even remember now. Oh well. <laughs> it is instructive in this context to compare Lawrence's definition of poetry to the following statement by Colin Turbane. The history of science may be treated from the point of view that it records attempts to place metaphysical disguises upon the faces of process and procedure. 
After the, disg after the disguise or mask has been worn for a considerable time, it tends to blend with the face and it becomes extremely difficult to see through it. The best way to do this is to show that it is only a metaphor, and the best way to show this is to invent a new metaphor. It is this process, I believe, that Lawrence defines in his preface to Chariot of the Sun. The poet discovers a new world within the known world, and thus deconstructs the umbrella of our convention, conventional system by inventing new metaphors. Implicit in Lawrence's statement and explicit in Turbain's is, of course, a view that of metaphor as a matter of ordinary language use, not merely a matter of poetic or decorative language, a view echoed by George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, who argue that our ordinary conceptual system is fundamentally metaphoric in nature, with the conventional metaphors of a culture reflecting the significant values of that culture. All right, let's stop right there for a sec. When I was an undergrad, I had a, uh, I was taking philosophy of science. I took a lot of philosophy of science. I had a very good philosophy of science professor. He said when he was in grad school, one of his teachers and someone made something was like just a comment. Is this just a metaphor? He said, look, he, he said something similar had come up when he was in grad school. And basically the teacher, his advisor said to him, look, everything is metaphor. There is nothing outside of metaphor. And once you can get that through your head, a lot more will fall into place. Because if you're trying to figure out what counts as a metaphor and what doesn't, you're you're going to have a bad time. If you just treat everything like a metaphor, you're going to do much better. And then maybe you'll figure out some things that are less metaphorical and more whatever non-metaphorical actually is. I don't know. But like it, starting from the position that everything is fundamentally metaphoric in nature, all of languages, you're going to be way ahead of the game. So, <coughs> okay. Oh yeah. And speaking of uh, things, uh, I'll get back to Akule. Akule, if you're still here, I will uh, send you the links to the stuff for getting papers when you're in school. Because I was just realized I was talking about school again. You're going to be in school. Good luck with that again soon. But yeah, just that's a point for when you're dealing with philosophy in school. Everything anyone says, treat it as metaphorical. You'll you'll have a better time then, as opposed to trying to understand what is like the real, or like the metaphysical metaphor is a better way of going. Just generally, conventional metaphors, pervasive and hidden, are thus metaphors taken literally. Those details stressed tend to stay stressed, while those suppressed tend to stay suppressed. What began as a figurative statement becomes, for all practical purposes, a literal one, shaping attitudes, belief, and even actions. And if the metaphor is sufficiently large in scope, and if it gains sufficient credence, it takes on the elements of a paradigm. Hmm. Let's see. Is this going to work? Huh. Now we're not going to get a bit... Now we're not getting bits alerts today. That's weird. Oh, I fucked it up. Let me see if I can fix this real fast. No, I did not change a bit, don't know. <laughs> yeah, what did I do? Huh. Let's see what happens if I just hit it. Huh. Well, that's interesting. Huh. Thank you for the bits. It's uh, Sinasemiak says, Bits are mere metaphors, and yet there is metaphorical arbitrage to consider. There is. Now, I have no idea why this did not work. It's supposed to be working at the moment. Um, a communications disruption can mean only one thing. Invasion. Yeah, well. Invasion by whom? And what? Because I thought he was trying to fix the gift subs, but I didn't touch the dono stuff. Huh. That's weird. All right, I have to fix that later. I have no idea what happened there. Let's try it. One sec. We can try something. Uh, let's see if this works. No. Okay. Everything. It's broken. Yeah. Oh, it's a Star Wars quote? Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you, you just gotta, like, leave those to, like, you know, 
what they really meant, a communication disruption can only is likely only one thing. Not only one thing, but it's likely only one thing. Did they check the power switch? Did they try to reboot? No, just the immediate assumption that it's an invasion. Well, you know. Yeah. But I mean, it's the military. What do you expect? <sighs> but yeah. Well. Broken clock. That's how it goes. You know, the broken clock's right twice a day. So many people have been right for the wrong reasons, uh, cinesemiotics, that you can't, I can't even stay angry at them. It's like, yes, you did it the wrong way, but like, well, so what? <laughs> it's like you're wrong for the right reasons quite often and wrong and right for the wrong reasons. Yeah, if you want to be angry about it, like, go ahead, but yeah. I like that you're angry. I think that's funny about this sort of thing. So you idiots, you're doing it the wrong way, but you got the right answer. <laughs> yeah, and so this is the uh, upshot. Once everyone starts believing the same lie, it becomes like a thing. And that's just how everyone's living. It's like it's the it takes on the elements of a paradigm. It's like how you shape your world in some sense. Once you start using metaphors, like it gets more pervasive. And that's like how you start understanding. Since semi access. It's like when people get mad at me for the way I play poker because I'm a gambler and I don't really play well, but then they see me win by chance and they get really upset. Yeah. Um People I've i I've seen people get mad. <laughs> and they deserve to win. Yeah, I've seen people get very angry at um what they have perceived other people to get lucky. And, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's kind of an ugly thing. It's like, what do you mean it was lucky? That's part of the game. And yeah, sometimes people are going to get lucky, but like, you can't be angry about it. Be angry at the cards. Like it's, um, stupid. Like years ago, um, there was this kid who was friends of, uh, I was at my old buddy of mine's wedding and, uh, we were playing poker, you know, the night before the wedding or was it after? Yeah, it was the night before the wedding. And uh, this kid, he worked for Google, and he thought he was smart. Or at least he thought he was smarter than us. And, uh, I mean, he wasn't a dumb guy, but he didn't actually understand that poker's hard. And, like, it doesn't really matter how good you are at other stuff. But, like, being good at poker, being good at other stuff does not translate to good like being good at poker and like someone who has like experience and like you know put time into poker is gonna win even if they're not like super brilliant at programming computers and so he was getting his butt kicked and he accused one of my buddies who is who used to play like semi-competitive poker of cheating or like getting lucky not cheating he accused him of exactly what you're saying you got lucky and you didn't deserve to win that pot and my buddy, like, he, the guy was giving him shit. And my buddy was like, he went into him for a sec. He started yelling at the dude. He was like, what the hell's wrong with you? It's like, he started, like, saying what the, you know, the chances of the uh, pot coming out the way it did was. And how, even if he did get a little bit lucky, it wasn't even all that unreasonable. Like, in the scope of, like, bad hands. Like, how bad was it a loss on the, uh, for the other guy? It wasn't that bad a beat. Like, it really wasn't. It was a small beat, but it wasn't, like, that bad. And so it was like... He just like told him to like sit there and shut up. You don't know what the fuck you're talking about. But it, it was just like, why are you getting angry at this? Like seriously, that's not the thing to get angry about. It's like especially if like you're just having fun gambling. Yeah, that's right. There is no there is no deserve outside of winning in poker. That's all there is. I mean, there can be bad beats, like someone had like a million to one shot of getting a certain hand, but like, did they work to getting a bluff that they got the right hand at the right time? Did like it all uh, average out that like, you know, they deserve to get a good hand once because all the other ones were crap. Like it's not, you can't call any one hand out. That's, you know, a fundamental misunderstanding of what's going on. Okay. <coughs> but poker's... A good discussion in itself. All right. So today, Turbane argues the metaphors of mechanism have become a pervasive model of just this sort. 
mechanism is, he claims, a case of being victimized by metaphor. Descartes and Newton have so impo imposed their arbitrary allocation of the facts upon us that it, excuse me, that it has now entered the co conesthesis. I don't know this word. Conesthesis of the entire Western world. Together, they have founded a church more powerful than that, founded by Peter and Paul, whose dogmas are now so entrenched that anyone who tries to reallocate the facts is guilty of more than heresy. He is opposing scientific truth, for the accepted allocation is now identified with science. It's true. Most in this is what people don't understand about like philosophy. It doesn't move that fast. Philosophy done in like 1500 is still like modern philosophy. We're still in using ideas from like the 15, 16, 1700s, like the sort of mechanistic universe of like balls, uh, pool and like the pool table, like Hume's uh dis version of the universe, where it's like atoms are just like little pool balls bouncing around on a pool table. That's hundreds of years old now, like hundreds. And it's like we're still using that. And so this is like coming out of Descartes and Newton and all of that. Well, this author is saying it's coming out of Descartes and Newton. But like you can't oppose that. It's sort of like the scientific worldview. And it's not a wrong way of... Uh, but I mean that's like the pool ball uh, the me metaphor of the universe. <sighs> the best way to show that the metaphysics of mechanism can be dispensed with, Turbain argues, is to invent a new metaphor, a conclusion inherent in Lawrence's poetics. It is no exaggeration to claim that the guiding purpose of Lawrence's canon is an attempt to provide alternatives to the metaphor of mechanism and implicitly deconstruct this conventional model. Indeed, Lawrence proceeds in what Robert Scholes terms a classic structuralist deconstructive mode of analysis, first locating the binary oppositions which organize the flow of value and power, then criticize, crit criticizing or undoing the individuous structure of those oppositions. The Lawrence's analysis is more implicit than explicit. Okay. So basically, yeah, you look at what needs to be what the main metaphor of the day, of the day is, what's the going thought of what is real. And so nowadays it's sort of the scientific worldview of sorts. I don't know how scientific it actually is, but it's a scientific e worldview. And uh, and you got to figure out how to uh, poke holes in that. And that's a fun thing to do anyway. I had a paper um, I read on roulette a long time ago, maybe in, like in the first hundred, and uh, it was arguing something about you know science was wrong, like just the concept was wrong about something. And it was a fine paper. You could see that like maybe the philosophers had like a little bit of a religious spin, but it wasn't like hitting you over the head with the religion. But like I sent them an email, or whatever, and they liked my. Uh, sympathetic reading of their paper and it was like you know the uh, I think the off one of the authors got back to me and said, uh, after I wrote to them and they said you know we're doing what we can here and you could get the sense that even though they may have had like a maybe they were religious philosophers and they had a purpose what they were doing in that paper was poking holes in the sort of scientific worldview and showing how silly it was sometimes and no matter what your position is that's still a good thing to do and that's kind of what was happening they were showing that the scientific worldview broke down at certain areas and that was a nice paper okay in dh lawrence's uncommon prayers sandra gilbert places lawrence in the, a tradition of underground poetry a tradition which holds that the poet is below the phenomenal windows of light thus calling attention to the locus of Lawrence's deconstructive efforts. Metaphors of special spatialization, or as Lakoff and Johnson call them, orientational metaphors. In Chapter 4 of Metaphors We Live By, Lakoff and Johnson explore the systematicity of conventional spatial metaphors, and they note particularly the way in which our cultural values, control, rationality, virtue, health, consciousness, and even life, are, are, are all imagined as spatially up. Thus, Lawrence's insistence, insistent use of down as an image and a metaphor functions in three ways. First, it calls attention to those binary spatial metaphors that are generally hidden. Who among us, for example, stops to consider the metaphoric nature of such phrases as high status? Second, it suggests a positive value for ups conventional opposites, emotionality, sexuality, and death. 
Finally, and most important, Lawrence's spatial metaphors do not merely reverse the conventional assignments of values, but rather reject the conventional taxonomies which establish life and death, for example, as separable, distinct states of being. What is spatially down is, in Lawrence's deconstructive metaphors, an epistemology of relatedness which emphasizes the inseparability of the categories established by conventional metaphors and thus the folly of privileging one of the categories over another. Yeah, it's true. Spatial metaphors are everywhere and like progress is always going forward. So you're moving like in some sort of direction when you make progress. Who knows what the fuck that means? But, you know, like it's a spatial metaphor when you're making progress. It's like you're going forward. Well, forward from what? Okay. Indeed, spatial metaphors provide for Lawrence the fissure in conventional metaphors, the point at which they can be pried apart revealing a consistent and mechanistic epistemology based upon three metaphoric and interrelated gestures of differentiation, up versus down, light versus dark, and open versus closed. It is this trio of metaphoric clusters that Lawrence implicitly analyzes and deconstructs via his own metaphoric creations. The key Laurentian concept of dark knowledge is, in essence, Lawrence's shorthand for his alternative epistemology of metaphor, an epistemology based on a deconstruction of the conventional visual and spatial metaphors hidden within the mechanistic paradigm. The remainder of this paper is an exploration of the D and reconstructions which compose Lawrence's metaphor of dark knowledge. Hey, Rethias, what's up? Yeah, we've got this uh, paper on metaphors and dark knowledge of Lawrence. And so it's uh, interesting. It's from a, a logic and language uh, journal suggested by Cinesemiotics. So it's going to be interesting. Binary versus binary. <laughs> up down versus left right yeah it's you know it, it's more about the metaphors not that it's binary it's just that you've got different kinds of uh directional things well we're gonna find out soon because uh it, they were just saying that basically we treat up and light as good things so we're gonna find out if uh yeah, what, how to do that. So I got an idea. Let me try something. See if I can fix my alerts. Because I don't know why my alerts decide to go crap the bed. Hopefully this won't break everything. But yeah. Yeah, I see. It's not... It just hadn't updated correctly. Yeah, things are busted. Oh, well. Nothing I can do about that now. I can, like, try. Dark knowledge is Dark Souls philosophy? Heh. <laughs> we'll find out. I mean, yeah, I could have a video game uh, thing. We'll find out. I don't know. It's like, I don't know how hard it is to define. If Is it actually uh, any good is the question, I guess. Um, I don't know. So, okay. Yeah, things are down. I did not realize that. I'm sorry about that earlier. But we will, uh, hopefully it may come back. whatever's oh great and i broke more things ah well who cares okay so we're gonna be talking about whatever lawrence's metaphor of dark knowledge is hegel is that skiing game on pcs in the late 90s that had the bottom of snowman who ate, ultimately hate me <laughs> i love that game yeah you'd like go left right you'd like zigzag down the thing and then eventually the uh, you'd always get eaten by the snowman <sighs> Oh, really? Like, you can get away with it? Like, I, I don't think you can live forever. Shift actually makes you go faster enough to get away from the thing? Uh. Oh, well. Yeah, did I break everything? I think I broke everything. Why did I do this? Let me try one more time. 
You can beat... Oh my god, you can. I, this is like news to me. I had no idea. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, I guess like you can go play forever if you're fast enough, maybe. All right. So maybe we'll be back. I don't know. We'll find out. So. Nope. Everything's broken. Ah, oh, well. What are you going to do? Okay. Screw it. Let's just uh, read the paper and we'll do it. The snowman always gets you. I always thought it did. I mean, I thought it was one of these inevitabilities. <sighs> well, I mean, unless you... I mean, you're going to fall over and it's going to catch up eventually. I mean, isn't that the case? Like, you're not going to outrun it. It has, like, infinite speed or infinite energy. Anywho. Okay, continuing this. Against the mechanistic metaphor, the physical world is a machine. Lawrence posits the metaphor, the physical world is a living entity. <laughs> Snowman can be outrun. <sighs> well, was it added? I mean, did is, is it that a 2007 version? Or is that a, like, 1990s, was it built in? Like, ah. Uh, uh. If it was always there, I'm feeling like I missed out myself. It was in the game, wow. Yeah, I'm feeling like I missed out now, too. Damn. Damn, all right. See how little you know about your own world. This is the problem. We know so little about even our own world. Okay. So Lawrence posits the metaphor, the physical world is a living entity, thus drawing the blinds of battle. Yeah, how little we know. As Lawrence wrote in a letter in 1917, there is a principle in the universe towards which man turns religiously, a life of the universe itself. The antithesis of this living universe is the mechanistic universe, as the following passage suggests. What can man do with his life but live it? And what does life consist in, save a vivid relatedness between the man and the living universe that surrounds him? Yet man insulates himself more and more into mechanisms and repudiates everything but the machine and the contrivance of which he himself is master, God in the machine. Life to Lawrence is a process which includes both birth and death. The antithesis of life is therefore not death, but is which is but one phase of the whole process of life and death, but rather mechanism, a polarity succinctly stated in the title of one, one of Lawrence's last poems. Death is not evil, evil is mechanical. The mechanical is neither living nor dead, merely inert. Mechanical is, of course, one of Lawrence's key terms, encompassing a whole cluster of associated ideas. The following passage elaborates upon the cluster of terms which Lawrence associates with mechanism. The moment man learned to abstract, he began to make en engines that would do the work of his body. So instead of con concentrating upon his quarry or living the things which made his universe, he concentrated upon the engines or instruments which should intervene between him and the living universe and give him mastery. Through poor instructional design, a bunch of people had this cynical horror story. Well, you know, I play a lot of Minesweeper. I've played a lot of Minesweeper in my life. And um, Minesweeper is just a cruel game. You're going to lose more than you win. And so I just thought that was, you know, how the world was. You're just going to lose more than you win. Like if you're from the United States and you know baseball, you are not going to hit the fucking baseball that much. You're going to lose. You If you hit 300 your whole career, you're a great hitter. But 300 is 30%. The article is already arguing that life is production. Um, we'll see. I'm not sure that's where we're going, but it might. Um, I think it's more anti-mechanical, but we'll see about where production falls at that point. So, 
not sure yet. Because, I, I mean, this is... Lawrence is not a philosopher per se, I guess. So, you might think so if, like, maybe... I knew Lawrence was a, like, philosopher of production, but maybe going somewhere else. Okay. Abstract engines, instruments, and mastery are corollaries of mechanism because they are divisive and hierarchical, creating and enforcing a compartmentalized universe. The consequence of these metaphors is alienation. As Lawrence writes in a letter, it is our being cut off that is our ailment, and out of this ailment everything bad arises. To Lawrence, the great evil of mechanism and its corollaries, rationalism and control, is that they sever man's vital connection to the remainder of the universe. Certainly in the metaphor, the physical world is a machine, entails, the, entails relatedness. Indeed, this metaphor has frequently been imagined by the clock, with its series of interrelated parts functioning smoothly as a whole. Nevertheless, the kind of interrelatedness implied by this metaphor differs fundamentally from the kind of interrelatedness implied by Lawrence's metaphor, the physical world is a li living entity. Awareness is, of course, a major difference. Machines are not alive, do not die, never feel pain, or joy, never think. So this is part of the interesting stuff. Like, right here, you know, this is what we talk about, like, robots and, like, you know, artificial intelligence things. They're not alive, they do not die, they never feel pain or joy, and they never think. Well, do we actually think this is, like, what is an artificial t intelligence thing? Is it a machine, or is it something that does these other things? So, I don't know. Let's actually have a... Actually, I want to have a little fun. Let's make this, uh... Make this so people who see the stream have a chance of actually seeing the stuff. Let's go with, uh... What's it called? Dark knowledge. Very hipster. Dark. Dark knowledge. There we go. Pure hypothetical tech with no substance. Well, you know, D.H. Lawrence knows how to write, so I'm not sure this is gonna. Nothing's losing quite yet. Pure hypothetical tech with no substance. Well, remember this is 1917, so we don't know exactly what tech he had in mind. He's probably thinking of you know like diesel punk or something at this point. Um, this is like pre. Uh, like, this is like industrialization, like pre-nuclear age, so. What's up, Tindarios? How you been? Hope you're doing well. <coughs> yeah. So, I don't know. I'm getting by, I'm getting by. Okay. So, but I mean, this is the question. What is it, like, that distinguishes life from non-life? Okay, and even more crucial to Lawrence's set of values, however, are these entailments of the two metaphors. The machine metaphor implies a mechanic, a mechanic. The organic metaphor implies some sort of guiding intelligence or instinct. Moreover, this guiding intelligence is inherent in the organism. The, mechanist, the mechanic is clearly outside the machine, independent of it, and superior to it as well. While one could argue that the guiding intelligence is superior to the rest of the organism, this argument can only be made if one believes that the guiding intelligence is distinct from the rest of the organism. Lawrence, however, rejects this conventional view. Why should I look at my hand, as it, is so cleverly, as it so cleverly writes these words, and decide that it is a mere nothing compared to the mind that directs it? Is there really any huge difference between my hand and my brain, or my mind? My hand is alive, it flickers with a life of its own. It meets all the strange uni it meets all the strange universe in touch and learns a vast number of things. My hand has its own rudiments of thought. It is just as much me as my brain, my mind, or my soul. So this is the thing. It's like he's saying, like, look, you've got like knowledge embedded into your hand. The hand itself knows stuff. And so now we're really getting away with this sort of uh, getting a, like farther from the standard view of like where the mind is and like what is the mind. So in Lawrence's metaphoric structure, each part of a living organism is connected to and inter interpenetrated by all the others and so renders conventional hierarchies of value absurd. Yeah, so once your hand has a brain, yes, you're like the big brain is important but like it's not as important once your hand also has a kind of a mind to it 
Similarly, both poles of any conventional duality are clearly interrelated, dependent upon each other by definition. Central to Lawrence's metaphors is this transactional view of dualities, a view which Lawrence expresses throughout The Crown. Remove the opposition, he says, and there is collapse, a sudden crumbling into universal nothingness. Mechanism is evil, Lawrence insists, because its taxonomies imply that the two halves of a duality are separable and distinct, while its value system elevates one half of the duality over the others, privileging stasis above, above change, the ideal above the real, the light above the dark. Read and wrap, what's up, how you doing? Punctures annoyingly, sorry, Lawrence says my hand has a mind of its own, annoying person. Um, okay, Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> Well, you have to give people like this a little bit of uh, credit. Uh, there's a lot of psychology that goes into like, like in philosophy, that goes into like gripping things. You don't actually think about like holding a bottle or whatever, or you don't actually think about all the little things your hand is doing when you, uh, you know, hold a pencil and you write. And so you have to actually think of the example he's giving when your hand is able to write. So you don't think about all the little motions when you're writing, you just write. And so the idea that like your hand has some sort of uh, built-in structure to it that allows it to do intelligent things is not a crazy thought. Now, it, does it have a brain of its own or some or something else? Yeah, maybe you want to think something else. But like the idea that your hand can do things that you are not conscious of is part of like your whole body. Your whole body's doing things that you are not conscious of. And so calling it have a mind of its own. Maybe that is not to your taste, but the idea that the hand can do things that are beyond your thoughts is not uh, crazy either. Subroutines, it's be it's believable. Yeah, I mean, it has something to it. Um, and like the shape of your hand, this is a, you know, comes out of phenomenology. Like what is it to grasp things? The idea that you grasp anything is a, a metaphor, like grasp ideas is the same way you grasp like a bottle. Um, and so this is a another metaphor of like grasping and like how you actually grasp stuff like i'm grasping the uh pen for the uh tablet here and like grab a pencil so, but like the, the idea of grasping like in that you can like somehow surround things with your thoughts or your hand similar to the way you surround things and like can feel all of something in your hand is um yeah there's a uh, maurice Mer merleau-ponty uh, there's a lot of sort of Heideggerian stuff that goes into this. So this is, um, people have been making hay with this. I just, I guess I should say you can't handle the truth. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. You live in a world where that I provide. <laughs> yeah. But that's the thing. Like, uh, can you fondle the truth? Read and rap. <sighs> Fuck white uniforms. <laughs> Involuntary processes, yeah. That comment was my attempt at humor, but failed in epic proportions. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were calling them annoying. Oh, I apologize. So you were on their side. <sighs> you know, it's always hard to, like, when you're streaming, it's hard to gauge exactly, unless there's a straight-up kappa next to, like, the, uh, the statement, whether it's a joke or not. Uh... Well, whatever. I don't. I'm not angry about the rant I uh, went on. So, it was still good content. <laughs> you boys are always happy to give us a ride to where the fighting is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want the truth. Yeah, it's like, well, what matters more, the the rules or the people doing the work? Like the hands doing the work. Well, but what's the abstraction? The abstraction does nothing. What are the rules or abstractions? So what? Where actually? Uh, where does the rubber hit the road? Where is? Where are you actually? Uh, in con uh, where are you actually like touching reality? Where is that a uh, boundary between whatever you are and whatever the rest of the world is? Hard to say. And that's the thing. It's like. Yeah, like this, it's like kind of a joke, but like you boys are always happy to give us a ride to where the fighting is. It's like yes, something is like you know provide like I'm the one out there in the world. You guys are just you know this sort of uh, support structure, but not doing the real thing. Okay. 
In the following letter, Lawrence contrasts the light values of conventional metaphors with his own concept of dark knowledge. Sometimes I am afraid of the terrible things that are real in the darkness, and of the entire unreality of these things I see. It becomes like a madness at least, to know one is all the time walking in a pale assembly of an unreal world, this house, this furniture, the sky, and the earth, whilst oneself is all the while a piece of darkness pulsating in shocks, and the shocks and the darkness are real. Sinus Semyonok says, it's interesting, I see a connection between a few good men and this. The military functions as a machine and it has to, however some of the things involved in making that machine function are not mechanistic. In fact, they are to be hidden from view because it's better that we believe them not to be there. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's still people doing a lot of stuff. And what exactly are those people up to sometimes? It's, yeah, who knows? People are people. They're, uh, Discord, me? Uh, yeah, I have Discord. Let's see, where's my damn Discord thingy? Socials. There we go. Uh, yeah, so there's the Discord. I hope that link still works. Uh, so, but, like, it's a dead Discord, basically. I just use it for notifications, and if people want to, like, DM me, uh, they're welcome to. But, like, I'm not actually very chatty when it comes to, like, writing stuff down. But, yeah, you're free to jump in and say hi. So what conventional metaphor suppresses that one is a piece of darkness pulsating in shocks is what Le Lawrence's metaphors of darkness are meant to emphasize. So is that what we really are? A piece of darkness pulsating in shocks. It's interesting. Okay. A quotation from certain Americans and an Englishman is it is particularly suggestive in its association of light and light and sight, darkness and touch. For it is a new era we have not got to cross into, and our own electric light won't show us over the gulf. We have to feel our way by the dark thread of the old vision. In conventional spatial metaphor, rationality is up and therefore good, since the eyes excuse me. Since the eyes are, in purely physical terms, the most elevated of our senses, they too are up, linked with rational understanding by means of conventional spatial metaphors, and additionally, through the conventional structure metaphor, understanding is seeing. This metaphor entails two additional structural metaphors, ideas are light sources, and discourse is a light medium. Yeah, so like, you want like to, you know, have a bright thought, like a light bulb, and that's like idea. All three of these metaphors are implicit in Lawrence's use of light. In the passage above, the electric light is the mechan mechanical product of rationalism, a metaphor for our conventional ways of knowing. Visuality is thus linked to rationality. Both rationality and visuality are implicit components of mechanism. Yeah, like, well, it's funny. Uh, I saw a few e a while ago. Yes, yeah, Sinasami actually shed some light on the issue. All the light metaphors but like the uh the old you know like light bulb lighting up above people's head heads that's gonna disappear in a few years because we're not gonna have incandescent bulbs anymore and there'll be different shapes because leds don't care about your uh bulb shape and so it, for eventually that whole metaphor is gonna disappear this cracks and everything that's how the light gets in well maybe that's how the light gets out it gets dark also it escapes as an alternative to the modern habit of visualization, Lawrence offers the primitive habit of feeling. As an alternative to the conventional structural metaphor, understanding is seeing. Lawrence offers the structural metaphor, knowing, a term more inclusive than understanding, is touching. This metaphor is implicit in the electric light passage from certain Americans and an Englishman. We must feel our way, Lawrence tells us, by the dark thread of the old vision. In addition to providing altern an alternative metaphor for understanding is seeing, Lawrence also provides an alternative to the metaphor ideas are light sources. He suggests that knowledge is dark. And knowledge is dark above all because it is non-visual, forcing us to rely upon our other senses. <sighs> now, I mean, like, d does knowledge smell? Like, what does, like, if, can we, sm can we sniff out knowledge? Maybe. I mean, can we, like, does knowledge have a taste? But, I mean, if, as long as it's just not light, 
that leaves a lot of uh, ground. But it seems like it's a knowledge. This is the old uh, thing from Heidegger that, or and also from Heraclitus. Nature loves to hide. It's that somehow nature is retreating from our senses at all times. And so maybe that's what Lawrence is trying to resist here, actually. That it's the mechanical version of nature that's kind of like, we're sort of like always pushing against the world and so the real nature is like retreating away from our mechanical understanding um yeah somewhere in the semiotics but this idea that like the world is sort of always trying to escape our senses is not a uh that was in heidegger but this is pre-heidegger so it's like yeah and uh heidegger is also aletheia the oh, the clearing the light was um Got Punk, what's up? How you doing? I hope you're doing well. We're reading this uh, paper on metaphors and knowledge in Lawrence, basically. Um, he called it dark knowledge. So that's the question. Like, if the world is always escaping our grasp in some sense, it's always like the light, it can't, it's like outrunning the light. The dark is outrunning the light, and we're missing it. So we have to use some other way of getting at it. But yeah, but I mean, how stinky is the the knowledge then? I don't know. Just like sniff it out. Okay. In apropos of Lady Chatterley's lover, Lawrence discusses the difference between what we may call light and dark knowledge. There may there are many ways of knowing, Lawrence tells us, but the two ways of knowing for man are knowing in terms of apartness, which is mental, rational, scientific, and knowing in terms of togetherness, which is religious and poetic. This latter mode of knowledge yields togetherness with the universe, the togetherness, the togetherness of the body, the sex, the emotions, the passions, with the earth and the sun and the stars. Got Punk says, I'm okay. Hope you're all doing well. I'll try to keep up to the conversation. Hey, whatever you can do. It's uh, all fair. All fun and games here. I'm getting by something. Okay, because of Lawrence's insistence on togetherness and duality, any attempt to value one pole of an opposition over the other is absurd. For the poles, the poles are language categories, not independent realities. Lawrence's deconstructive mission, however, leads him to center in his own metaphors on the down, dark side of the scale, a tendency intensified by his concept of the purpose of art, expressed in the proper study. Know thyself, which means really know thine own un know thine own unknown self it's no good knowing something you know already what we know already is of course the light M visual metaphors of mechanism the unknown is the focus of lawrence's alternative metaphors yeah so i mean what was interesting actually in the beginning was the original metaphor was of a you know a parasol uh, uh shielding you from the sun and the idea was that the sun gets through but the sun's like a blinding thing so it's like not you're not staring into the dark you're not staring into the chasm you're being like sort of blinded by the chasm the sun is overpowering so there's a difference here between the dark and the light in the sense that the real light is like is you can't handle it you can't handle the truth no you can't handle the sun that's what it is you can, don't look at the sun never do that because like you can't handle that and so this is the question what it's not the light it's the unknown and some sort of in some sense of like some uh like the darkness is not just chaos unto itself the darkness in some sense it has to like you know you need chaos here and that's really what's going on you need something other than uh light and dark so it's the unknown self what else is there left it's not just the poles okay the metaphors of mechanism focus upon an epistemology of light and visuality. Lawrence deconstructs them or pokes holes in them by focusing instead upon an epistemology of darkness and touch. More importantly than this reversal, however, is his insistence that both poles of any duality exist only in, a, in relationship to each other and that the truth of any relationship is a matter of flux and change. Thus, he is quite naturally concerned with infusing his alternative metaphors with motion. In the following passage from Etruscan Places, Lawrence describes a sort of bowl, a round saucer with the raised knob in the center, which he claims represents the round germ of heaven and earth. I mean, it sounds like a dip bowl, you know, like a bowl, like dip, and you have like something in the middle that's sticking up so that you can carry it and like put the dip bowl down or whatever. Or maybe you have like the chips in the middle. It stands for the plasm. 
also of the living cell, with its nucleus, which is the indivisible god of the beginning, and which remains alive and unbroken to the end, the eternal quick of all things, which yet divides and subdivides, so that it becomes the sum of the firmament and the lotus of the waters under the earth, and the rose of all existence upon the earth. I mean, that sounds great, but it really sounds like a chip bowl where you've got chips on the outside and a spot for dip in the middle. This atomic form, a microcosm of the living universe and all of the entities which make up the universe, comprises two parts, a nucleus and a shell or rind. The nucleus is the eternal part of each organism, its energy, which has its life in the vast continuum. The shell is the form or matter. It is not and should never be permanent. Metaphorically, the nucleus is spatially down, located deep within each organism. Thus, when Lawrence writes that we must struggle down to the heart of things, where the everlasting flame is, he is recreating the image of the round saucer of the Etruscans, with the everlasting quick at its center. Within each organism, the nucleus is its core, or heart, thus depending upon the particular microcosm under consideration, this core may be the human heart, the underworld, the heart of the earth or even the dark sun, the heart of the solar system. All three are metaphoric nuclei, centers of the Holy Ghost, and all three are metaphors for energy. Okay, so I'm still going to go with my chips and dip metaphor, but that's fine. Yeah, I mean, we're going into essentialism here, basically. We've got like this, um, the quick, you know, cut them to the quick, the whatever the... Uh, essential part is of a person that's what like cut them to the quick means you know you cut them down to like the heart or whatever it is uh getting to the humors you're getting into the things that make up the uh essence of a of a thing and so we're, we've gone away from uh we're kind of going back uh to like these sort of well the author here not necessarily um lawrence but the author here is reverting back to you know sort of the pre-mechanical theories of uh, life and stuff. So you've probably got humors, you've got the quick, whatever that might be. Um, you've got an everlasting flame, of course. Though That's uh, metaphysical. Flames go out. So, and holy ghost. So, yeah, I'm a little concerned that uh, the author here might be mixing metaphors with Lawrence that Lawrence would not have accepted, but you know they have to do something to try to tease out what Lawrence is saying otherwise you're just gonna be stuck with the original text anyway okay in a sense Lawrence's nuclear model is a variant of the nonconformist metaphor of inner of the inner light Lawrence accepts the spatial orientation of the nonconformist metaphor inner but he rejects its implicit visuality and rationality indeed his nucleus might well be called the inner dark the non-rational, non-human energy, the carbon existing within all living beings. This force, this queer nuclear spark in their protoplasm, and here we're going uh, it's in the semiotics, here's your dark matter. The queer nuclear spark in the protoplasm as dark as Lawrence elsewhere calls it may be described as the energy which impels all living entities through a series of allotropic states, that is, states which change the form but not the essence of the organism. It is this capacity for, indeed necessary for, transformation that distinguishes living creatures from mechanical objects. Yeah, so we've got, here's your dark matter, um, basically. It's the quick. Every living form is thus a pattern of movement. The human body, or any other body, lives because it is a complex of motions biologically, circulation, respiration, digestion, and by Lawrence's metaphor of cor correspondences, as below, so above, psychologically as well. Human consciousness, like the human body, is an energy field, a pattern of experiences, sensations, thoughts, and feelings in continual motion. Thus it is the metaphor of the old, stable ego of character, as he calls it in his letter to Edward Garnett, that Lawrence most consistently attempts to subvert for the static ego with its will to persist neutralizes both life and death and utterly defies the holy ghost the the unpardonable sin you see this is interesting like if you think you have like a mechanical mind then you've lost basically whatever free will in like the modern lingo it is because the mechanics of the mind just then it just runs like you know a clockwork a universe then you're just like clicking through the little uh, gears but like where's the will 
So it's just will to persist. It's not a will to do anything. It's just persisting. So that's it. Um, will to persist only neutralizes both life and death. So, In sharp contrast to Lawrence's dark metaphor of the self as a nuclear cell alive in the tissue of the universe is the static visual metaphor of self common well, of s visual metaphor of self common to mechanism in art and morality Lawrence elaborates upon this conventional visual metaphor for the self this is the habit we have formed of visualizing everything each man to himself is a picture that is, he is a complete little objective reality, complete in himself, existing by himself absolutely in the middle of the picture. All the rest is just setting background. To every man, every woman, the universe is just a setting to the absolute little picture of himself, herself. This has been the development of the conscious ego in man through, through several thousand years since Greece first broke the spell of darkness. Man has learned to see himself. Now he is what he sees. He makes himself in his own image. Throughout this essay, Lawrence uses the Kodak snapshot as an emblem for the mechanistic man, egotistically self-absorbed, completely isolated from other people and from the rest of the universe, trapped in his scientific vision. As an emblem, it is particularly apposite, combining visuality and the machine. In addition, Turbain describes the way in which Descartes Newton and Locke, the founding fathers of mechanism, explained both human vision and later human understanding in general in terms of a picture-taking machine or anachronistically a camera. Locke and his colleagues proceeded, proceeded to represent the facts about the mind in the idioms appropriate to cameras. Just as there, there are images in the back of the camera, so there are ideas in the mind. Just as there are obscure and confused, clear and distinct images, so there are obscure and confused, clear and distinct ideas. These idioms, some of which are still fashionable, refer to the central concepts in 17th and 18th century epistemology. See, this is great, because like this is still what the hell we're talking about. We still say these things. We have not gotten away from these ideas that are, you know, hundreds of years old. Turbain also notes the defects of this mechanical model. It can illustrate the dioptics of the mind, that is, the mind as passive substance or understanding which receives, supports, holds together, and owns its ideas. But it cannot illustrate the optics of the mind, that is, the mind as actor which combines, compares, and interprets its ideas. Yeah, these, these theories have... Uh, uh, what, what's her name? Uh, criticized Descartes. Princess... Dagnab, but I can't remember her name, but she basically called Descartes out immediately and said, look, you can't actually have a mechanical mind the way you're saying it is. And she blew like holes in all of his arguments and she was very good. So it's like, shoot, I should know her name. But anyone who wants to look up, you can look up uh, Descartes um, correspondence with, I have to find it out. Excuse me for a sec. Let's go find out what it is. Descartes correspondence with a princess. Yeah, Elizabeth of Bohemia. Thank you. Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia. Yeah, I was just annoyed. I couldn't remember Elizabeth. Thank you, Valpo. But, like, yeah, if you go look up her criticisms of uh, Descartes... She basically had a lot of uh, this in there already. Okay. In Laurentian terms, this metaphor denies the quality of motion, thus the defining feature of living creatures. Because of this shortcoming, Turbain notes, it was necessary to postulate a ghost inside the machine to do the interpreting, a concept not unlike Lawrence's sense of modern man as a god in the machine. A pr yeah, and so also we've got Ghost in the Shell nowadays. Go watch that anime. It's fantastic. A prisoner trapped in his own metaphors. Lawrence deconstructs the camera metaphor, turning it back on its creators in his rival metaphor. Mechanical man is a snapshot, isolated, static, and inert, a product of his own invention, an image in his own mind. So yeah, so we've got trapped by our own metaphors by thinking of ourselves in this mechanical uh, mode, this mechanical metaphor. And we got trapped into that idea. 
Two things have created this metaphor of the snapshot represent, representing the old stable ego of character, the cultural primacy of the visual and its corollary tendency to confound the fixed and the intelligible tendency to see outlines and boundaries even when they are not really perceptible. The snapshot metaphor allows the illusion of permanence and fixity, the illusion of a stable, definable self apart from its setting. But even this metaphor deconstructs as painters have long known in a step in a stepladder to painting, Jan Gordon, Jan Gordon notes that the outline is one fundamentally unrealistic, non-imitative thing in the whole job of painting. So, And Harold Speed in The Practice of Science and Drawing adds, the, A line seems a poor thing from the visual point of view, as the boundaries of masses are not always clearly defined, but are continually merging into the surrounding mass and losing themselves to be caught up again later on and defined once more. Thus, the most important metaphor in Lawrence's cluster of dark knowledge, the metaphor of openness, is both visual and sensory, both conventional and novel. It's interesting, alright, so as opposed to like closing down an outline, like it's sort of like that's a closedness, so there is no outline anymore to whatever counts as uh, knowledge. I don't know. The no the, all right, let's see what the author says. The notion of openness functions metaphorically as an extension of Lawrence's atomic metaphors. Since the nucleus is energy, it is the part of the organism which has its life in the vast continuum. But in order to stay part of the flux of life and death, the nucleus must have a means of exit from the rind. It cannot become trapped in any fixed structure. In Lawrence's metaphors, life is a continual process of change and flux in which nothing, no individual, no idea, no system, no, including Lawrence's own, can be permanent. All right, and so who called out the uh, uh, philosophy of process earlier? Thank you. You get plus one point. You get a, st you get a, a little star sticker. This matter for to live is to be open is central in his quarrel with mechanism for openness is the central distinction between living things and mechani mechanical objects. Thus Lawrence frequently Im imagines and you know, images the ego, the mechanic, the mechanistic self as as a hard rind, a shell, an envelope and a circle contrasting these closed structures to the open ones of a bruised fruit, a shattered shell, a cracked dome and a spiral. I mean, I, I'm finding this openness a little bit hard. I mean, there's sort of this uh, non-closedness, I don't know how to say it, but like, there's like, yeah, a shell, a rind on the outside that you have to break through, but it's still, again, it's uh, this is a little, I think this one's a little tougher. Whatever. Let me know if you guys have ideas about what the hell some of this means. More important than these specific images, however, is the way in which Lawrence's epistemology of dark knowledge with its insistence on openness influences his style as a writer. His concept of the poet as an enemy of convention combines it with his view of the novelist as a chronicler of subtle interrelatedness. To yield an ambivalence about language, that Trojan horse that carries over into one's criticism of a culture and the very metaphors and values one attempts to subvert. The tendency of language to enforce conventional metaphors leads Lawrence, I believe, to a series of characteristic stylistic features. Style becomes metaphor. In an attempt to create an open metaphoric texture, he piles metaphor upon metaphor, image upon image, mixing metaphors drawn from nature with those drawn from astrology, alchemy, myth, and psychology in a fashion denounced by R.P. Blackmer as hysterical, confounding a purely rational detangling of imagery. Even more significantly, Lawrence frequent, Lawrence's frequent shifts of metaphor provide an inherent open texture or self-deconstruction. The plethora of images points up the fictive nature of all of his constructs and prohibits any one of the metaphors from crystallizing into a model. A parallel case can be made for his use of compound adjectives and fluid syntax for the submerged narratives animating his major volumes of poetry and for his tendency to end his works on a less than final note. In his metaphors, Lawrence is firmly, even perhaps rigidly, committed to the notion of openness, a paradox which spirals back on itself, creating his alternative metaphors and his epistemology of dark knowledge. Okay, this was fun. I'm not entirely sure. I mean, this is not like... This is one of the criticisms of philosophy is that it gets itself too navel-gazing back at itself. See, this is interesting. You want to go look at who has a different epistemology, you go look at a uh, poet. 
maybe they have something new to say about what knowledge is. Now, here's the question. You have to then, you don't actually even have to take Lawrence's uh, version of the world, but do you have to take, you, we do have to take this understanding of metaphor very seriously, because like I was saying before, even in philosophy, metaphor gets used all the time. And so have we overdone this sort of static version of even the way we're talking about things? Has that thrown us for a loop? And maybe it has. And then, then maybe we can mine Lawrence for seeing if there are new metaphors within uh, the poetry that can give us a new way forward through like our very sort of static uh, version of the world. I don't know. But I mean, it's like, this is the question. If you're going to go with dark knowledge, you're not just like drawing outlines around things. Things are hazy at all the times. And even hazy is a visual uh, thing. But like you could say, you know, it, there's fluid uh, distinctions. And so like the distinctions are there, but like, you know, they slide. And so this is the problem. How do you start talking about science in that way and you can't you really can't and so the question then becomes well what do you do you, you can't throw science out you just can't throw science out like you we need this stuff to live nowadays but how do we make progress instead of just doing the same thing over and over and over and over because we're gonna make the same mistakes over and over and I, I, I can guarantee you all right now you go look at all the problems we have in the world we're not solving them using the old crap from the past. It does not work that way. We have all these new problems because these are the new problems that are we have with all the old ideas. And so we need new ways to go through. Um, so here's the question. Can we get out of this sort of visual, mechanical uh, version of the world? I mean, we can't, like, shifting metaphor all the time, open texture, self-deconstruction, self-deconstruction, like, just layering image on image on image that means there is no one uh, view of things. It's hard because, I mean, we have a, you know, a view of, like, what counts as science. Like, and you can't layer, I mean, or maybe we could layer more and more images on top of it, more and more ideas of, like, what an electron is. So... That's the question. Like, is this is this a methodological? Is there something methodologically useful here in taking the like the idea from poetry that we could apply it someplace else? Because I mean, just we can't just assume that these metaphors work. But can we take something further, like sort of the idea of what's going on here, and uh, apply it into other areas? I don't know, because. It's fair. We do get locked into our way of seeing the world. The metaphors we, you know, basically run back to. Like, that, that we, this is how we are, like, comforted or whatever. Like, this is how we think the world is. But those metaphors change over time, too. <sighs> Let's see, is there anything specific to say? It's hard because, uh, I mean, for me, I, I, I don't know enough literature, frankly to uh, draw different like connections between this and other stuff um, so so yeah it's like instead of going up and out you, we, you have to like sort of turn inward and like spiraling or like a, an inward spiral but I mean how does that help you in other areas but yeah okay does anyone have anything else to say? I'm trying to think of other things to say. It's just kind of hard to... Uh... Whenever you're trying to do some one of these like sort of alternate like paradigms, like however you're seeing it differently, you got dark knowledge where you're not talking about like how you see things you're not coming to the light you're not talking about the structure of things you're talking about no instead these things are all you know amorphous you don't feel them you don't see them you have to like feel something about them it's like eh. it gets hard because most of our the way we discuss the world nowadays is in the scientific sort of mindset. What are the parts? How can we analyze it? We're not talking holistically about things, and that's difficult. How do you actually talk about something if you can only say, well, it is just how it is, the way it is as a whole? Or, and if you talk about it separate from even 
its surroundings you can't even talk about it. it's like the whole thing it's like you got you and the universe but like it's the whole universe and you are open to the universe the universe is open to you but like then you lose any uh you lose specificity about what you're talking about and once you start to do that it's a lot harder to uh you know for people to understand you if you can't say specifically what you're talking about people will be like well shut up you're not making any sense i don't know what you're talking about so yeah but this is the thing sometimes you can like you'd be like look your metaphors you're using are not good and that may be a good thing to point out here in the sense that like the the way we're talking about the world in this sort of stasis of mechanism because the mechanism as it just is is unchanging the mechanism never changes it, it never lives it never dies that might be somewhere to go um to look at like what is the stasis of uh the mechanical uh viewpoint so and that would be an interesting thing to like investigate notions of stasis in uh the mechanical theory um now, do I, can I think of anything like that? I mean, of course, there's like process theory, but I mean, like the metaphor of stasis within the mechanical worldview. What does it mean to be stasis? One of my favorite uh, quotes uh, that Darwin put at the, uh, in the second version of, on the origin of species, and then put it in all future versions. So this was not in the original printing, but it was in uh, the second printing and all forward, forward ones after that. He put uh, this quote from William Wewell, who is a philosopher of science. Um, the only fixed meaning of nature is... No, the only meaning of nature is fixed, stated, or... Uh, fixed, stated, or stable, or something like that. And it's just like, that's what they think of as nature in this sort of sense. It is a notion... Nature as stasis is a thing. And so... Like, that is how Darwin really thought of, like, the world was, like, nature is a kind of, like, fixed, stated, or regular is the quote. The only, understa like, the only understanding of meaning is it being fixed, stated, or regular. And that's basically a mechanical worldview. So, like, this stuff matters. Okay. But I don't think I have any further things to say. I would like if chat has anything further to say, you let me know.